on this computer. All right, so welcome back, everyone, uh, to uh, Living Stronger Longer, the podcast, Living Your Best Life After 40. And today, I'm excited to have uh, Mr. Steve Maxwell, who has uh, graciously agreed to spend a little bit of time with us. And Steve and I, I don't know if he even noticed my name back then on the on the uh, lists of uh, members of the Super Slow Exercise Guild, but I believe when I first learned of Steve and, and uh, his spouse at that time, D.C. Maxwell, was back at the beginning of the Super Slow Exercise Guild. And Very big uh, what was that? Very big <laughs> Yeah, and then, and then uh, later on, I think I kind of lost touch with where Steve had, had wound up. And more recently on Drew Bay's uh, hit list, uh, private group. I've seen uh, Steve come back on and I've also as a result of seeing some of his posts and also looking at some of the videos that he's done and things like that. Um, realize that this gentleman has uh, a great deal of knowledge, a great deal of background history about what we do, as well as in the uh, martial arts, because uh, he is uh, he'll correct me here, but he's a black belt in Gracie jujitsu and I believe he continues to teach classes uh, in that field and on the topic of living stronger longer he continues to be fit and work out and I I believe that he's almost 49 or 59 years old I'm uh, being kind he'll likely correct me there uh, and that's one of the things that I think is really important to this podcast is lifelong training uh, being able to find something that you can do for life and remain functionally able to do it. So, Steve, uh, what what blanks would you fill in? How did you come into, you know, sports and, and uh, fitness and all that? Tell us a little bit about yourself for the benefit of our viewers who may not be as familiar with you. Well, I'll be 70 years young in just a couple months. Um, I decided I'll collect Social Security this year. <laughs> Doesn't pay to wait any longer. Uh, I started as a young boy in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Uh, I was uh, 12 years old. My dad bought me my first barbell set and I went out for junior high school wrestling, seventh grade wrestling. Um, I had been the subject of bullying because I was a small, weak boy. And my dad was a U.S. Navy boxer during World War II. He was actually the Pacific Fleet bantamweight champ. They used to put the ships together and tie them together. And uh, they would put on fights on aircraft carriers or battleships. They'd set up a ring and, you know, like a dozen ships would come and they would have these boxing tournaments. And my pop was pretty handy with his fist. And he didn't like having, you know, seeing his son being pushed around by the older, bigger boys. So I started lifting with the old York barbell courses in my father's basement. And, uh, you know, it was a short jump from there to uh, Iron Man magazine, the old Perry Raider. And, uh, you know, I, I actually did some pretty productive workouts back in the day. Uh, maybe you remember the old 20 rep squat routine with the gallon yeah. of milk. And uh, I, I got pretty big and strong fairly quickly and became a very, very good wrestler. And because of wrestling and my love of physical training, I decided to become a physical education teacher and majored in college, four year university in health and PE. And I wrestled four years division one NCAA. It was a very successful wrestling career. And I was always looking for ways to better my wrestling. I never lifted for powerlifting uh, or Olympic lifting, <clears throat> although I did play wrestling. Weightlifting was never the, the end result for me. For me, it was always about becoming a better athlete, better grappler, better wrestler. And uh, I discovered the first Nautilus gym uh, near Philadelphia. Uh, this is outside of Westchester, kind of between Westchester, Pennsylvania and Philly, a place called Huff and Puff Gym, first Nautilus gym owned by uh, now Dr. Gregory Ellis. He's a PhD and a guy by the name of John Carton. And uh, they put me through my first Nautilus workout with the old Jonesian style. And uh, I had heard about Jones in the magazines, you know, strength and health. And 
and uh, Iron Man and was intrigued with his ideas. I was convinced he was on to something. And uh, that first workout pretty much put me through the floor. You know, here I was a varsity wrestler, probably, you know, young, might have still been a teenager and in the best shape of my life. And I couldn't believe how intense and how hard that workout was. And uh, I was convinced. So I started working there part time on weekends and during the summer. Uh, the guys gave me a job and I learned all the Nautilus training principles. I, I devoured uh, training bulletin number one by Jones and continued uh, after they moved to uh, another place. And at that time I was teaching school, hallway school and coaching wrestling. And then part-time on weekends and during the summer, I would continue to work for those guys. And uh, that, that was my start. And I was involved with high intensity training. I eventually set up a Nautilus gym in Philadelphia um, at the old Society Hill Club. Uh, that was like a real destination point. Um, we were the first people to have, the, maybe you remember the old duo squat and the uh, first, uh, the very early uh, lower back machine that Jones was working on. And a lot of the, uh, lot, a lot of the newfangled machines that he was coming up with. And I ran that successfully for almost a decade before eventually opening up my own gym, Maxercise, in 1990 with my uh, now ex-wife, D.C. Maxwell. And it was right around 90 that I read Ken Hutchins' Super Slow Manual. I think it might have been 89. And as you had told me, I called Ken up and talked to him, and I was really intrigued by his ideas. And we decided that we were going to use Super Slow as a protocol in our new gym, Maxercise on Chestnut Street in Philadelphia. We were like one block from the Liberty Bell and Independence Hall. So we were right downtown in the historical section of the city and on a second floor. And uh, had a really nice line of hammer strength, old vintage Nautilus. Um, Ken came and we were the first group to go through his uh, super slow uh, certification. certification. Yeah, he stayed there for a whole week. And he retrofitted my machines with super slow cams. He, he actually made the cams out of wood and plastic. <laughs> really? Yeah, and they worked. And he replaced a lot of the chains with, uh, with uh, straps. And uh, they worked great. And, you know, the, the resistance curve was beautiful. And, um, yeah, he, he put us all, me, my wife, and my staff. And then my ex-wife later became uh, a master in the uh, guild, master trainer. But... Um, then, you know, things changed. I, I got lured by the dark side, you know. I, uh, I started looking at other methods of training. And I, I had been training pretty steady from, was super slow, from about not, uh, not 1990 right through to about 1998, 99, when I started looking at some other forms of training. Um, that was mostly due to like a midlife crisis, perhaps. Um, maybe just, I don't know. I let myself get bored. I, I felt, I fell for the hype on the kettlebell. I was reading strength magazines. I read this guy, Pablo Sassolian, who was a really, really good writer. In those days, anything Russian was so mysterious, you know, of course now with, you know, the politically correct society, you mention anything Russian, it's like, oh, those evil people you, know, you don't dare even mention Russian anymore but back in those days anything Russian was like really cool yeah. kind of reminded me maybe you remember back when the macrobiotic movement um, you know anything Japanese was good anything Asian you know that was during the 60s and 70s you know well it was like the, the yeah. Russian way yeah, well, you know, on on that on that note, you know, I, I I believe that the majority of people all over the world are wonderful, good, decent people, and including today's Russians who are probably suffering, uh, you know, disproportionately as a result of of what's going on. It's the leaders of various countries that are often uh, not so good, Absolutely. and unfortunately, people tend to paint the entire country as a result of the actions of their leaders. I mean, the United States 
a wonderful country, but their leaders have at times, uh, perhaps more than a few, done some pretty stupid things, right? Pretty heinous things, that's right. Um, I've, I've been to Russia, by the way, eight times. Okay. And I trained in Russian martial arts as well as jujitsu. I became intrigued with uh, the Russian system of training. Uh, they, they have a military, they call it the system, Sistema. And I trained with a whole bunch of different guys. And I, I know Russians to be wonderful people. So, you know, politics aside, you know, people are just people. They just want to have a good life like we all do. Yeah. But um, anyway, I got lured to the dark side. I started training with dinosaur training, sandbags and kettlebells. And uh, I started swinging clubs and maces and all that. And it absolutely works. There's no doubt that all these systems work. Body weight works, gymnastics works, powerlifting works, you know, high volume, low volume. You're going to find people that have been successful doing damn most anything. But uh, I always like to uh, quote my friend Drew Bay on this. Just because someone gets a particular result using or doing a particular system doesn't mean he couldn't have got better results, faster results but the most important thing, safer results, doing something else. And that's what I learned. It was all well and good to do this stuff. I can't say it didn't work. I was strong, I was fit. I, I, I won many jiu-jitsu tournaments. And, but uh, what I was finding was all this stuff, uh, you pay a price. And, and that price is wear and tear on the joints. And I began to suffer injuries, mostly like overuse. In particular, my right shoulder really started bugging me. I believe the primary culprit was the Turkish get-ups and the snatch with the kettlebell, but God knows, probably all those things. And, you know, we can't forget I was doing jujitsu and rolling around. With <laughs> so, yeah, I started getting uh, pretty bad osteoarthritis in the right shoulder. At that point, I curtailed all kettlebell, and I started going back and taking a hard look at what I was doing and why I was doing it. And um, I started going back to super slow bodyweight calisthenics, which I could do quite well without any pain in my joints whatsoever. And I also uh, started looking at isometrics. And then when I uh, looked at the time set of contraction isometric, uh, I was absolutely intrigued. I thought, wow, this is a great protocol for people with achy joints. And, you know, it's funny because I had an, um, uh, I used to do isometrics back in the 60s in high school with the old York power rack. That's where you would kind of hold the barbell against the pen at different right. uh, positions. And I also had like a little portal, portable isometric device. It was just basically a stick with a chain attached to another little a piece of wood that you'd stand on. But you can do, you know, uh, various isometric uh, pretty well. There's pictures of Bruce Lee using an almost identical device in pictures. And um, so I knew isometrics were pretty good. I knew they worked. But, you know, like a lot of things, you just, who knows why you ever stop doing them, you know? Well, one of the things you said, you mentioned about everything absolutely works. And, and I agree with you, but I guess uh, recently uh, I've been a, I made a post and I talked about, you know, which system, when people say system A is superior to system B or system C, whatever it is, um, I, I always think it's only superior if it's superior for a lifetime. If in some six week or 12 week research project, you can show that a certain thing uh, does better results than a certain other thing over 12 weeks. To me, I, I don't really care because I'm just thinking if that system is gets me better results for 12 weeks, but by the time I'm at 36 weeks, my joints are starting to bug me, then I don't care. And and I, I need something that I can do for a lifetime. I but agree. If I can't do it for a lifetime, then, and I think it's, I forget if it's Bill Desimone who said, uh, you know, if you can't do it for a lifetime, then you probably shouldn't be doing it at all. You know, right. a specific exercise, right? 
Well, so, it's kind of, we have a principle like that in jiu-jitsu. It's basically, if you can't pull that move off on a guy that weighs 230 pounds, then you have no business muscling some smaller guy. You want to uh, use the proper technique. Same thing with strength training, you know? If you can't do it for your whole life, then it's probably not that good in the first place. And um, I, I, I look at Dr. Richard Wynette. I'm sure you've probably heard of him. He was yeah. a high-intensity trainee. And the guy kept in marvelous shape well into his seven. He probably, in his, is he, I don't know, is he still alive? I don't know. And uh, another model, role model for me was Clarence Bass, who right. trained once a week. And uh, he would do like a high intensity interval training once a week. So he'd ride his airdyne once a week. And a few days later, he'd do a, a um, high intensity uh, single set uh, workout uh, on machines and some barbells. And there was a guy in his 80s that just looked marvelous and uh, was still very fit, very fit, and no real joint problem. Well, and, 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 sir, go ahead. Yeah. Well, you know, he, he also was feeling so good. He started going back to Olympic weightlifting there for a while, I think when he was in his 60s, just because he was feeling so good. But then he quickly realized, no, nope, wrong direction. And he, he quickly stopped. He started playing around the Olympic lips again. Right. Well, you know, you talked about isometrics. And I remember, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was one of the early Ellington Darden books that Arthur Jones was quoted as saying that wrestlers were some of the strongest athletes there were because the nature of wrestling is there's a lot of isometric contractions going on when one person is holding the other person you know they're, you're kind of each person is using the other person as a source of resistance and there's a lot well, of you know lengthy things and in a sense uh grappling i would think a lot part of it is a whole bunch of consecutive isometric contractions going on that is absolutely true you know and of the course then there's some explosive dynamic stuff and then you know static and that's one of the problems with this uh, training for those type of sports, supplementary training, because they are very strenuous. Like Muay Thai, uh, you know, where there's a lot of clinching or judo or Russian sambo or Brazilian jiu-jitsu or, you know, freestyle wrestling. I mean, it's a form of resistance training. So you're doing it all the time. So when you add supplemental training, it's very easy to overtrain. Right. Burn your same same with modern MMA. So many of the guys' careers, I think, are ended early because they just don't understand, you know, uh, what overtraining is. And I think many of the injuries that we see were probably created in the gym. You know, like you'll see, like, uh, uh, I'm an NFL football fan. And, you know, you'll see sometimes a guy out there in the field and all of a sudden he'll pull up lame or you'll see, you know, he'll blow a knee out. And it's not even a contact. You know, it's not even a contact. Um, you just wonder, like, wow, what, what happened there? His pro athlete, and he just blew his knee out. Or sometimes you'll see sprinters do the same thing, like in the Olympics or whatever. And a lot of people don't realize that that injury had been built in the gym and had been brewing for months and months, doing questionable exercises like box jumps or you know, jumping with weights on your back or plyometrics. And every workout was like a, like a subacute injury. Like right. every time the guy would do his workout, he was insulting the joints to the point where they are just getting weaker and weaker. And then during the competition, when the pressure's on, bam, it goes. But the real cause wasn't what happened on the field or in the UFC cage or on the wrestling mat. It was caused by poor training in the gym right well i i think uh, yeah I, I agree i did a podcast with mark asanovich you probably know of mark mark was in the nfl as a strength coach for a number of years i think 14 seasons and and he said that you know there are likely and i paraphrase mark if you happen to be listening to this if i if i misquote you please correct me um that you know there are probably a lot of athletes that we never heard of who could have been household names, but never even made it to the pros because of injuries in the weight room 
that were career ending and career. and never even wound up being you know making it or, or had a very short careers which is tragic but one of the things is as we make more distinctions and we get a little bit smarter hopefully is i think that subjecting ourselves to extremes occasionally whether it's through a proper strength training whether exposure to cold water whether exposure to you know saunas i've come to believe that exposure to extremes in order to elicit some sort of an adaptation response is a good thing provided it's done occasionally but the mistake often is well if a little bit is good then a lot <laughs> is better but the fact is that these are all stressors right oh, and, and 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 so your body can adapt to a certain amount of stress below a certain amount of stress your body um, gets worse in some way shape or form and above a certain amount of stress your body can't deal with it and starts to go the other way so it's sort of an art if you will is finding where's that that sweet spot right where you can expose yourself to extremes that create an adaptation response and then back off and allow the response to actually occur a lot of people's general health is so poor that they don't have any extra adaptive adaptation uh, energy not enough energy for any kind of adaptation they're just barely maintaining point zero it seems that um, medical people seem to think that if you're asymptomatic, that you're healthy, but nothing could be further from the truth. A lot of people are kind of like, I would say the majority of people that I meet are somewhere between sickness and health, kind of like in that gray zone where the slightest little thing, like exposure to cold or too hard of a workout will push them over the edge into illness or sickness. Yeah. And I, I don't think enough people are looking at general health and well-being as part of their bodybuilding strength training program. The young guys is all about getting big, big muscles, big G whiz biceps, and you know, getting small and and you know, benching a certain amount of weight. And they forget about this very important at, 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 um, adaptive energy you need like an energy reserve but you can only do that if you build your health well and i it's interesting you you brought up because this is one of the places i wanted to sort of dive into was this preoccupation in some case obsession with getting bigger muscles right the aesthetic part of it and to some degree i mean i i will freely admit to you know, looking at myself in the mirror and checking it out. And I, I mean, my vanity is alive and well. Uh, but I've come to realize that getting large muscles, first of all, and, and I'd like to know, because in the last three years, I started training other people. I've been training in this method and working out since 1981. But in the last three years, as I've trained people and I got body composition and analysis tools and things like that, I'm starting to really question the whole idea of significant hypertrophy as how how common or how rare it actually is. And and I think a lot of research and a lot of, uh, of, of anecdotal or, or whatever t tended to go that if you increased your strength, there would be a commensurate increase in muscle size. And I, you, you'll remember, I'm sure, that Arthur Jones, when he used to say that the average untrained individual can probably triple his starting level of strength. Uh, and you remember he used to say, but his recovery ability likely only improves by 50%. But even though somebody increases their strength, I find that people can get a lot stronger. Many people, I, I'll even suggest most, but I'll ask you because you've been around longer than I have and probably trained a lot more people that a lot of people can get significantly stronger, but it's a fairly small subsection of the population that actually gets the kind of muscles that people will notice, you know, without maybe when their shirts are off, if they're lean enough, but if they're just walking around in a t-shirt or a suit, very few people get, 
you know, the kind of muscles that will make people turn their heads when they go by. What, what's your experience been with that? Well, it's a very, very, very small percentage of the population. It's like the same percentage of people that grow over seven feet tall. You know, if we were to sit in any mall anywhere in the world, a shopping mall and watching people walk, you might see one really tall guy. And most people would be of average height. And maybe you would see an occasional uh, midget, very small. It's the same thing with muscle size. That's about the same level of potential. Only just a very small percent of the population has the ability to get those big G whiz muscles. Most people can definitely get stronger and there is a corresponding increase in muscle size, but that's also genetic. Some people can increase strength due to neurological efficiency and leverage way more than what their hypertrophy would indicate. I've seen many people that would just get stronger and stronger and just very moderate hypertrophy. And I have seen the opposite, uh, very few, this is rare, where people would get amazing amount of hypertrophy with just moderate increases in strength. And a lot of people get really confused about that. And of course, then there's the confusion of demonstrating strength versus building strength. Right. You know, people, you know, like when you're when you're doing a, a lift like a bench press and your goal is to lift as much as possible, you do absolutely everything in your power to make the lift extra easier. You shorten the range of motion, you arch your 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 back to give yourself the best leverage. You 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 try to work only in the strongest range of motion. You use momentum and you know all that kind of stuff. Whereas in our game, we're trying to make the exercise as absolutely hard as possible to build that general strength. And that, that this is like a, a big confusion, you know? So I, I haven't seen very many really muscular people in, any, in anything. And because I was always in a weight class sport, it really didn't pay to get too heavy because then you start to uh, outstrip your, your, your leverage. For example, as a college wrestler, I just wanted to get really big. And I did a 20 rep squat routine and drinking a gallon of milk a day. And I went from about 154 pounds to about 205. And my freshman year in college, I realized, holy shit, I'm wrestling these heavyweights who are all well over six foot tall, had much greater reach advantage. I was like a short, compact little fire plug guy. And I, it, it was a really dis big disadvantage. So I ended up stripping all, all that weight off and ended up wrestling 158. <laughs> well, I, I'm reading a book by, right now by a gentleman named Alan Aragon. Yes, and, I, I know. And, uh, and uh, the book is called uh, Flexible Dieting. And, yeah. and, and, and I haven't gotten all the way through it yet. And, and much of the book I, I would recommend and I think is good. But there's a chapter where he's talking about what people can reasonably expect as far as hypertrophy. And I think that the examples he used are, are chosen very badly. So I don't know if you've ever heard the argument that, you know, to see whether somebody's using steroids or not is whether there's a cutoff of fat-free mass index over 25. He's basically saying anybody, now he's not saying, but it has been suggested that anybody who's fat-free mass index is over 25 is very likely to be using steroids because the idea being that the, the most uh, that you can likely do natural is a fat-free mass index of 25. But then he goes on to say that the average untrained individual is maybe, I forget now, the number 17 or 18. And if you could get up to 25, which was what he suggests elite natural bodybuilders are, then your potential is somewhere in between. Well, and I read that, I thought, well, first of all, most of us do not have the potential to get to even an elite natural bodybuilder. By definition, they're elite. So they're- They're elite. They're, they're, mean, elite and, is like 1%. And, and the other thing is that most of those elite guys, I'm gonna suggest, and I think I could, I, I think I could, I would bet a small amount of money on this, 
is we're above average before they ever touch the weight. That's right? correct. I heard a, an interview the other day uh, with Roger Schwab. I think, is that, am I getting the name right? You know, you must know Roger. Yeah, I know Roger quite well from there. Yeah. So he was saying that Mike Menzer, at 15 years old, already looked better than most people were ever going to look after decades. And I think if you look at old pictures of Arnold Schwarzenegger as an 18 year old, 19 year old, so even these guys that got to that 25 fat free uh, mass index probably didn't start at 17 or 18. So I think just, and you know, there's a saying, I, I'm not a religious guy, but I, I'm going to make a quote here from the Bible. And I think it says, to those who have much, much will be given. And to those who have little, little will be given. And I think that's true, is they tend to get guys that are big and strong before they go into the gym. They wind up getting even bigger and stronger. And you get the so-called 90-pound weakling, the, back, the guy on the back of the comic books, you know, that was buying the Charles Atlas thing. And he can get stronger and bigger, but he was probably never going to beat up that bully. Uh, you know what Unless I mean? He took <laughs> What's that? Unless he trained Gracie Jiu Jitsu. <laughs> oh, yes. Fair, fair enough, right? You're right. He wasn't going to. So I, I just think that because, and Mr. Aragon, the author, is trying to give people real, what he calls realistic expectations based on the average untrained person and the average elite natural athlete. Well, I think most people, as far as hypertrophy goes, um, their potential is a lot less. I mean, we always knew that it was a lot less than what the muscle magazines would have us believe. But I think maybe it's a lot less than that, which leads me to my next question is, and I'm, I'm asking you to speculate, which is unfair, is if it's so rare from an evolutionary perspective, is it even maybe suggested from an evolutionary perspective that large muscles are not necessarily conducive to, you know, overall health, like beyond a certain point? Well, let's look at animal husbandry. And let's look at the prize bull or the stud horse or the show dog, you know, muscly, big, strong. They have very short lives compared to the other livestock. Is that right, quite, eh? Quite, quite a bit. This has been well known for years, your prize bull. And we also know uh, from bodybuilding history that many of the strong men and athletes had relatively short lives. Of course, it depends, you know, like contact sports like NFL, collision sports, the guys have very short lives, man. You know, I, I, it's, it's, it's shocking how, what the lifespan is of that. Yeah, I've heard that with the NFL. I don't know is below 60 years old i mean you know like that and i i believe that well and then let's look at another thing let's look at the blue zones i'm doing a jujitsu training camp on the island of ikaria in uh this july and uh it's one of the, one of the places where people uh, a huge majority of the population live to be over 100 and these blue zones have been identified as um, Okinawa and Sardinia, uh, Villa Cabamba, Ecuador. Uh, there's a place somewhere in the Caucasus Mountains in um, Georgia. Uh, Ikaria is one of them. Did I say Sardinia? Uh, Loma Linda, California in the United States. Where an unusual amount of people, um, also in uh, Japan and uh, Okinawa. Anyway. What do all these people have in common? Well, they're not eating high protein diets. They're not gouging themselves with all this protein. They're not all lifting weights trying to get big and swole. You know, they're living, they're, they're, what you had said earlier about moderation, not too much stress either way. Enough stress, but not overly stressing themselves. Now, none of these people are interested in hypertrophy or what they look like in the mirror, you know? They're not, that's not their lifestyle. They lead simple lives, eating simple food, drinking good water, and relatively emotionally stress-free, and in areas that are fairly non-polluted, where you can get good food, good water, breathe fresh air. That seems to be, oh, and of course they have good social networks. Many of them, um, yeah, they, 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 they feel useful in old age. They're not you know, like 
some societies like the U.S., old people just kind of get, you know, marginalized and, you know, pushed off to the side. But these people are revered for their knowledge right. and their, their wisdom and their experience. So if you look at those factors, then yes, I think you're right. Beyond a certain point of muscularity, you're just wasting adaptive energy and probably using up a lot of your life force. You may be shaving some years off the end of your life. And especially if you're emotionally attached to the body, like overly attached, like a body identified, this can cause a lot of psychological problems for people as they age, because we're all going to wither and die. Our bodies are just flesh sacks that are going to disintegrate and no one gets out of here alive. Fa Father time will eventually win. It will. So it doesn't pay to be too overly attached to this, this flesh sack. Yes, we want to be healthy. Yes, we want to look our best and feel our best. But getting too emotionally upset about not having huge arms or chest or, you know, an eight pack is pretty, you know, it's just a big waste of, of energy. It's well, really Jeff Casebolt. Um, who I don't know if you know that name. He's one of the guys who come up with the uh, Dynavec Gluteator, if you've seen that machine. I actually have. That looks pretty interesting. And uh, he said, an interesting quote I thought from him was that only about 6% of Americans strength train. And, I can believe that. And he said, and about, he, he speculates that over half of them have an unhealthy relationship with strength training. I actually believe that too. And I think part of that is uh, the preoccupation with large muscles, like the over preoccupation with large muscles. And I think also uh, a lot of people who don't stick with it because, you know, they, they, they want it's You know, you used to say uh, men give up strength training because they can't be as big as Arnold Schwarzenegger and women never take it up because they're afraid to be as big as Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? But the fact is that um, I think a lot of men, I think that's true on, on the man's side, but the, the tragedy, I think, is there are so many other health benefits from so proper strength training that it's a tragedy that people you know, who can uh, derive all those benefits, don't stick to it because somehow or other, or, or, or as you said, keep looking for the other secret thing, the new supplement, the new method, the new whatever, because, you know, they're not getting as big as they think they should be able to get. And they, you know, keep wandering around the wilderness, if you will, from, Pro from program chasing. Yeah, program chasing when the fact, I mean, you've seen lately, and actually you were complimentary. I post sometimes after a workout before I jump in the shower and I've been, got a bit of a pump on and I can turn just the right way so that the sun's hitting me just the right way and, and I can hide. You know, for a 63 year old guy, I look pretty good, but I, I'll be honest with you, if I turn the other way and relax my muscles and whatnot, you might say, I don't even think that guy even lifts weights, right? I mean, he does, doesn't look like he works out to me. Um, but, you know, I, I'm 63 and I'm still, I mean, you're still rolling around on the mat with young guys, uh, much younger than you and doing what you're doing. And, and of course, both of us, touch wood, uh, so far are, are maintaining relatively good health and energy yeah. and able to go along our, our daily lives. So it's... Well, that's why I prioritize health over anything else. But let's go, let's take two steps back. So there's something you said earlier. <clears throat> let's look at the standard for male beauty for the last 25, 2,500 years. It was the ancient Greek statue. Right. It's only been very, very recently that the big G whiz superhero look has come into vogue. Sorry, the, that, the big sorry, G whiz superhero. Right, right, right. You know, like the comic books. Uh, I, I can remember the early Spider-Man comic books. 
the physiques of the superhero guys, the old DC and Batman. And then over time, how they became like this exaggerated form that kind of mirrors like the society's expectation. And, but if you look through his, back in history, before steroids, before profane, okay, what did a really well-developed male look like? And you can look at those ancient Greek sculptures. By the way, they weren't white. They were painted flesh colored. A lot of people don't know that. Right. Yeah, but at any rate, I've been to Athens. I've been to Rome. Uh, I've been to many art museums around the world. And they're quite inspirational. But if you look at Michelangelo's David, right, or you look at that ancient uh, Greek uh, wrestling youth, or, you know, this is a well-developed male. And I'm sure that the models for those statues were probably idealized by the sculpture. And possibly they were the elite of their day. But this is about what a person could expect to look like at the absolute best. Another thing you might look at is the self-improvement contest that Bob Hoffman used to run in Strength and Health magazine during war. I used to collect old magazines during World War II, you know? And some of those guys really had nice, lean, muscular, athletic physiques, but none of them would be mistaken for a bodybuilder. <laughs> right. Well, then, I, Go ahead. And then there's one more thing uh, uh, as far as health benefits of, of strength training. I had an old fellow come to me who wheezed and gasped for air as he negotiated my steps up to my gym exercise. I was on the second floor and, you know, we didn't have an elevator. It was a really old building. The building went back to the 1890s. It was an old textile manufacturing building. So it was very old. And uh, the stairs were very steep. And this poor old fellow could barely get up. He was out of breath. He had to stop and pause midway. He was leaning heavily on a cane. So I put him through the most simple exercise program you can imagine. Just basically eight exercises. And he was so stiff, I, I, I could barely get him into the leg press. I mean, I had to put the darn seat back near the whole way and he could still barely get his leg in there. Right. But over time, we increased his range of motion. And I took very careful records, you know. We did a simple push-pull. I did use a Nautilus pullover, you know. And, uh, but it was just a very basic push-pull with a rotary pullover torso and a leg press. And that's about it. I worked his calves and feet and not much else. Uh, I would do like rear extension on the four-way neck. He, he had such horrible kyphosis in the forehead. I was loath to do any forward movement with him but in time his posture corrected and that man within a year and a half had tripled his strength just like you had mentioned there i kept meticulous records he was three times stronger than when he came in and a lot of people would have said oh well he's so out of breath he needs cardio but just it is because his legs were so weak every step was like a maximal squat for that right guy. right so he, he he got rid of the cane he walked up those stairs like a normal person. His gait improved. And lo and behold, he started playing golf again. And he loved golf. And about three years later, he died. But those last years of his life were really excellent. He was like, I think it was 82 when he came. 82, 83. I don't remember. But, you know, uh, his last years of his life were actually quite good. And he improved the quality. What had happened to this guy was he just got really depressed and sat around for, you know, like 10 years, literally just sitting, not moving and just stiffened up. And he, he finally decided he wanted to do something about it. But it goes to show you that at any age. Oh, and by the way, his weights were probably better than most younger guys like starting weights. Let's say, for example, I started a young guy in his 30s or 40s. Uh, the old man's weights were. Uh, higher than what like a beginner 30 or 40 year old would do. So he basically reversed the aging process through good proper scientific training. And we would work out twice a week, about every th uh, th three or four days. Yeah. So it improved the quality of life tremendously. He went from barely able to walk to walking normally, climbing stairs, playing golf. And that's what strength training can do for anybody.
Right. Yeah. It's and it's uh, and 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 I think if we get our expectations uh, more in line with reality, you know, you're talking about um, back in the Roman days and and what the model of and the superheroes today, which is kind of like our 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 modern day Greek gods, if you will, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, but I think Doug McGuff, I seem to remember reading that the young men who stormed the beaches of Normandy were on average about 140 pounds. Yeah. Right. So, you know, these were these were the guys that, you know, conquered, you know, defeated Germany and whatnot. These were not 210 pound linebacker guys. These were average guys. And I don't know whether that's changed or not. Well, I'm sure the, the there's a lot people are I believe people are carrying a lot more fat on average today than they were in 1944. Uh, but, but I think people were in good shape, but they weren't big muscular guys. Even if you look at the pictures of Steve Reeves, well, I still look at Steve Reeves as kind of being the physique that most of us, you know, I mean, we'd never achieve it because even he was way above the average, obviously he was Steve Reeves. But compared to today's, or even, you know, the Arnold Schwarzenegger or whatever, Steve Reeves doesn't look that big, but he looked great. He looked fantastic. Yeah, I was always uh, 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 really uh, admired some of the um, TV movie stars. Like, uh, I loved Robert Conrad, the old Wild Wild West. That guy, uh, I, I just loved the way he looked. He was one of the first guys to uh, actually do uh, uh, karate on TV, right? Like one of the early pioneers. And, you know, there was various guys that played Tarzan that, uh, you know, were, would not be mistaken for a bodybuilder, but man, they look great. Like Jock Mahoney, for example, you know, that, that those type of, and of course, you know, let's not forget Charles Bronson. Right. What a fantastic uh, uh, physique that guy had. And, and then, you know, there was a bunch of guys like that. Is it Chuck Connors, Rifleman? He looked fantastic too, you know. Yeah, and yeah, uh, I saw. I, uh, I I I like to watch old movies and um, trying to think. This guy Jack Palance looked fantastic. I, I, I was just trying to. I was I, literally you took the words because I was thinking about uh, City Slickers and Jack Palance. When yeah. he, you remember when he accepted the award uh, for best supporting actor, and yeah. he got and then he got down and started doing some one arm push ups on yeah. the floor and he was i don't know he was in his 70s i think by that time he um he i just watched that old anthony quinn movie barabbas you know the uh, the the thief that was uh, set free um uh, because they wanted to crucify uh jesus and uh he ends up being a gladiator in rome and has oh, yeah, an, yes, epic, yes. an epic fight with jack palins who's like this the evil gladiator and uh, it's really wonderful but palins looked so great in that movie it was like amazing and you know then well even kirk douglas even though he didn't have big muscles in the movie spartacus where he fought woody strode the black athlete woody strode looked unbelievable and right. even kirk looked damn good and th this is like average expectations of what average guys could expect right well and I, I also, you know, I, over the years, um, I played pickup hockey for a number of years. And so you get to see a lot of naked men, right, in the showers. And, yeah. these, and, and these are guys that, you know, they, they play pickup hockey. They're regular guys. And a lot of the guys would, would, you know, lift weights or do something other than hockey to try to keep in shape. And yet it was extremely rare to see a guy in the dressing room who looked big and muscular, like, you know, beyond a certain point. Most of us look pretty ordinary. Type yeah, of thing. thin, wiry, lean, you know. It's and like even, I wrestled all my life. I mean, even, you know, occasionally you see a really muscular, well-built wrestler. But it was amazing how many guys were just very normal looking or even skinny, yet they were like national level caliber wrestlers well today yeah uh, to me early on that you know big muscles don't necessarily mean that you know that you're a good athlete or that you can fight or that you can wrestle or that you can do anything 
Well, mixed martial arts of which now, now do you um, have you competed in uh, in mar mixed martial arts in jujitsu or? I've competed in a lot of jujitsu tournaments and and what they call no gi like submission wrestling. Right. Uh, I I was actually uh, won the Pan American Championship six times in my age division, and I was a three time world champion in in my age division, age weight belt, which is you know very fair way to to compare yourself but uh i uh, i was a little bit too old for mma i, I didn't even start jiu-jitsu until i was 38 and by the time the ufc rolled around i was in my late 40s right i was 48 i think well past my prime you know and certainly wasn't going to risk get my my brain injury you know i had enough enough so today there are there are still competitions that are in specific martial arts as well as this mixed martial arts is its own thing, right? Like you could compete in just judo or just uh, jujitsu or whatever or, or karate, and then this yeah. mixed martial arts that we watch on TV that that of course is is becoming very popular, probably more popular than boxing these days. Um, and uh, but that that's its unique thing where that's mixed martial arts. So in other words, they're just whoever wants to get in the ring, whatever background they tend to have, uh, do that. And I, now those uh, men and women who do that, some of them are phenomenal uh, athletes, to say the least. Um, but they would have a vested interest in getting as strong as they possibly can. Uh, but not necessarily as big as they possibly can, because then they have to compete in a higher weight class. Correct. You want to be as small as possible while being as strong as possible. And I would think that that has more to do with genetics than an actual training style. Like people will say, well, he'll train for strength rather than size. But I would think it probably has more to do with, you know, it, people who will uh, do well tend to have the genetics to get really strong without getting really big. Is that a fair statement in your opinion? Yes. And, but it, it has nothing to do with the actual training, you, you know, like the training is the training and whatever level of hypertrophy compared to your level of strength is a hundred percent genetic. It has nothing to do with the type of training, you know, multiple sets and muscle spinning and all that. Uh, it does, you know, in the long run, it's not going to bring you any to any higher level than if you just do the single set high intensity training over time, you know, over a lifetime. You're not going to get any further. So, do you like it? All brings you to the same place. It just depends how much time you want to spend and how much wear and tear do you want to subject yourself to. So, do you, um, are you happy with where martial arts sports is going? Has MMA been good for martial arts? Mm -hmm. uh, do you have their pros and cons? In a, in a, in a way, it's certainly exposed, uh, you know, martial arts that don't work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it qu very quickly exposed, you know, uh, things that don't work so well. We know that, uh, you know, boxing and kickboxing work pretty good, you know. We know that wrestling works really well. And uh, we also know that jujitsu is an absolute must on the ground. Right. And I think if they went back to the old rules and took the gloves off and wouldn't stand people up, you know, for the spectators, you would probably see the wrestlers and jujitsu guys pretty much dominate most of the fights. But once again, that would be boring for the average person and they would lose viewership. But, you know, under the current rules, um, it's, they've really evened the odds between the strikers and the, uh, the grapplers. And, the, you know, they, they put those rules in there to, to do that. Uh, what I don't like is where judo is gone. It's very boring. And uh, at the higher levels, you know, when they meet each other, like I've watched the Olympic tournament. And pretty much they just nullify each other. And of course, they don't do any grappling on the ground. It's just so rule laden. By the same token, I really hate what's happening to jujitsu competitions where people just immediately just sit on the ground and they don't even attempt takedowns. And it's just like 
this crazy spider game on on, on the ground. I, I don't like either one. I'd like to see, you know, I, I'd like to see it. Uh, and of course, there's going to probably be a lot of people that uh, are outraged by these comments. <laughs> so, and now, is that a fun? I, I don't like the way sport martial arts are going. No, I, I don't. So, so is that a function with the, with uh, jujitsu? Is that a function where there may be a couple of rule changes could do yeah. it, or whether it's just a matter of doing like in hockey, for example? Um, I don't know if you're a hockey fan, but people will talk about a certain uh, hockey style called clutch and grab, and clutch and grab is where it's not exciting because you're just trying to slow down the really fast, exciting players and keep them at bay. And you can win games and championships that way, but it, it you're, you're robbed of seeing the really beautiful skaters and everything the do their guy. thing, right? Yeah. So it is sort of a similar parallel with what you're describing a bit? Yeah, it's just become so stylized. You know, uh, much of the sport grappling and so forth uh, it's lost any uh m most of the practicality is gone i mean you couldn't defend yourself in a real fight with any of this stuff you know you get yourself chilled if you tried a lot of this stuff you know i i i still like the the overall approach of the graces where self-defense is number one knowing how to defend yourself in the streets and and and, and then of course there's a whole game of jujitsu versus jujitsu, which is like a game of chess, which is a lot of fun to play. And I still like to roll, but I, I, I think that they've lost a lot of the marshalness in the jujitsu. Now, for some guys, they don't care. They just want to play the sport. That's all well and good. I don't condemn anybody for that. But I still think that to be a black belt in Brazilian jujitsu, you should know the complete self-defense syllabus to call yourself a true black belt. Just my opinion, you know. I'm sure there's plenty of people who disagree. So, but, uh, would, would, you, would you recommend? Uh, so, I took a few jujitsu classes uh, about three years ago when I started, and then my business picked up, and I just quickly realized well, two things. I realized I was the only trainer here, so if I hurt myself, uh, I couldn't train people. And second of all, I got so busy that I was not able to go very often, and. And my instructor said, you know, unless you come two or three times a week, it's going to be hard for you to really improve your skills. But one of the reasons I was going was I thought, you know, and I, I understand if I'm faced with a physical confrontation in everyday life, unless I'm protecting my wife or a loved one or whatever it is, the best strategy is to just run away and, and, yes, avoid, and avoid confrontations. But I always thought, you know, that in a jam that I should be able to defend myself in some way, shape, or form effectively. But when I got into jujitsu and we were using the, the geese and all these things, it just occurred to me that it bore very little resemblance, I think, my perception, because I've never been in a fight in my adult life. I think I might have been nine years old last time I was, you know, a little wrestling match with my, my little buddy because we got upset over something. And it just occurred to me that what I was learning there, which was fun and I enjoyed it, a great bunch of guys, great camaraderie, the instructor was good, probably bore very little utility to if I was in a situation where, you know, I might have to defend myself or defend loved ones in, in the face of a physical confrontation. But would you're, you, you're 100% correct. It's, it, the way most people teach it, it is is useless for any kind of realistic self-defense. That's why the Gracie system is different than regular Brazilian jiu-jitsu. They put a premium on the stand-up self-defense to allow older men or smaller, weaker people or women or even children to be able to defend themselves against bigger, stronger, faster people. That was the whole purpose, to allow you not just not to win, but to survive. But I do agree with you, you know, avoidance at all costs, you know? We have the three A's, awareness, avoidance, and then only as absolute last resort action. And, you know, if by the time you have to defend yourself, you already messed up. 
you know, you've already got yourself, you already missed all the signposts right. and right. all the warnings and you didn't hear them. You know, being really aware and, you know, just getting out of there and avoiding the situation before it even happens. It, that, there's an art and a science to that too. Well, in, in, and earlier, jumping back a little bit, you talked about how mixed martial arts exposed things that didn't work. And I recently read an article, and it's interesting, it talked about scientists in the lab and whatnot, and it compared it to people, you know, uh, and Doug McGuff said this, as many of the great discoveries have been done by people he referred to as tinkerers, like Arthur Joan would be a tinkerer. You know, it wasn't in a lab, he was just thinking, he was trying things, he was doing different things. And then the scientists often come in after the fact and explain why it works. And, and sometimes they even claim they came up with it in the first place. But often some of the great progress <laughs> is made by just, you know, everyday sort of tinkers, people who are thinking and things like that. And this article um, was talking about how, you know, this was a, not to get in a controversial thing, was talking about some of the things going on right now with with COVID and things like that, and how some so-called lay people seem to have a better handle on how to handle this than, than some of the so-called authorities. And the, the analogy that he used, I'm going some, I'm getting to a point with this, is with martial arts, he said, you know, you, you watch the old Kung Fu movies and things like that, where people were jumping in the air and doing these incredible moves and things like that. And, and then they said, well, how come some of these guys weren't coming into the MMA and doing that? And apparently a few of them tried and were quickly destroyed by, you know, the grapplers and whatnot. And, and it, you know, nothing you see in MMA looks anything English. like a Kung Fu movie. What's that? Yeah, and even other forms of uh, boxing or kickboxing, you know? Yeah, they don't, yeah. They, they, nothing you see on the MMA looks anything like a Kung Fu movie. No, not not at all. You know, the movies basically ruin people's perspective, realistic perspective, just like the muscle magazines ruin people's respect uh, perspective about like what can be done with bodybuilding and all that kind of stuff. But I'd like to end. I'm going to have to leave here. Yeah. But I, I would like to say this for folks out there listening. You do not need a MedEx line of equipment or Nautilus or hammer or anything else. With just your body weight and isometrics, you can achieve whatever genetic potential you have. I, uh, I'm going to paraphrase Arthur Jones. He basically just said with, uh, with a chin-up bar and a dip bar and, and squats, body weight squats, you could reach your full genetic potential and be as big and strong as you ever are going to be, just using basic, simple exercises. Yeah. And then he went on to mention how he met a guy that just basically did chins and dips for his upper body and had some of the best arms he had ever seen. Yeah, I agree. I mean, as a matter of fact, I, I have about 20 machines, but my basic exercise program that I, I do all the other ones is um, uh, accessories or whatever it is. But my dips, chins, and my leg press are my three basic ones that are that I make sure I'm progressing on those three. You can't go wrong with that. You yeah. cannot go wrong with that. But yeah. anyway, yeah, I, I mean, I could talk for another hour, but I, I actually have a... Uh, a well, no, I, I thank you very much for taking the time. It was fascinating. And, and uh, yeah, thank you for me on, on your uh, podcast. I really appreciate it. We can do it again sometime. I look forward to doing it again. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend, sir. Hey, you too. Goodbye okay. now. Bye-bye now.